EdTech Mondays Africa is supported by the MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning in ICT and is part of the Foundation's Young Africa Works programming. Glad you could join us on another edition of EdTech Monday Africa. My name is Joy Doreen Vera. Our topic this month is digital literacy, a crucial component of 21st century skills. On our previous edition, we examined how pivotal it is for young learners in Africa to have strong foundational literacy and numeracy skills necessary for further learning and the development of advanced skills that are critical to economic development and the well-being of individuals and communities. One of the recommendations was to introduce technology-enabled learning at the foundational level to not only boost lifelong skills, but to introduce digital literacy sooner to increase learning outcomes. Digital literacy, simply put, means having the skills to utilize communication and information technologies to create, evaluate, and communicate messages requiring technical and cognitive skills, a key component in fast-tracking 21st century skills. However, according to the 2021 Ibrahim Forum report, 82% of young learners lack internet access and at least 20 million live in areas not covered by a mobile network. Learning institutions cannot afford to hire teachers, instructors or professors who have the relevant skills, thus limiting the quality of education received by these young learners. And with sufficient investments, increased digital literacy can lay the foundation for faster adoption of hybrid models of learning, which in turn have the potential to, in the long term, accelerate the acquisition of skills relevant for today's workplace. This month, we are connecting the dots by seeking to understand the power that EdTech holds in delivering and assessing these 21st century skills. And we're asking, what are some of the digital literacy skills that can be developed among learners and educators using EdTech tools and solutions in Africa? Share your feedback with us on edtechmonday at mastercardfdn.org. We will be so glad to read your feedback. Our expert panelists are Nelly Chaboy, founder and CEO of TechLit Africa, Dr. Basun Tijani, co-founder and CEO of Cock Creation Hub, also known as CC Hub in Nigeria, and Ramadani Matimba, Adapt Project Coordinator, Global eSchools and Communities Initiative, Jesse, based in Tanzania. And to all of you, it's so good to have you on this edition. Let me start with a quick question to us all. In the world today, education and technology go hand in hand in fostering and preparing learners for the future. What is the case for Africa? Thanks, Joe. Uh, that's, that's, that's a deep question to start with. And, you know, it's, it's deep because uh, fixing education or improving learning outcomes on the continent of Africa is, is a wicked problem. Uh, wicked in the sense that we do have structural issues that historically we've been trying to fix, uh, you know, some of which includes, uh, you know, teacher to student ratio, uh, some of it includes infrastructure, like lack of access to quality education infrastructure to support learners, but also the fact that this infrastructure are not, uh, they're not evenly distributed. What you have in certain urban areas is not the same you have in rural area. But unfortunately for us, I think the world is moving at a pace uh, which is being disrupted as, as well by technology. And the implication is that how people learn, how people get access to information and knowledge is also changing. You know, five, six months ago, most of us weren't talking about chat, uh, chat GPT, but today artificial intelligence is now fully embedded and is disrupting education all over the world significantly. So our challenge in Africa is how do we balance the need to fix the structural issue with the fact that the world is moving at a pace that we also need to catch up with. This, this is the challenge that we have on the continent. But also given the fact that the future of work itself, what we used to talk about future of work two, three years ago, is now the reality of work. So the skill set that people need to be able to participate in gainful employment is also changing. 
So we do have a continent with a lot of young people that we need to train and give opportunities to. But at the same time, we have all these challenges that we need to grapple with. So for me, I think it's an interesting question you've started with, which is like opening the Pandora box. It is a complex one and it is a wicked problem. Great, I like that. And uh, Nelly, what, what, what is your take on this uh, in terms of Africa's current situation? We cannot ignore technology anymore because it's such a magnifier, right? It's a, if we don't talk about it, if we don't think about it, then our kids are not safe online. If we, we just can't, you can't ignore it. We just have to do something about it. And something about this fourth industrial revolution is that it's so big. It, it's, not, it's not like the trains, so or it's just like the scale is insane. So at the scale of disruption is so big. And then also the scale of failure, or the scale of, so it's almost like this, exponential problem that we have to look at and and again just echo what he says in that we just have to do something <laughs> that's what we're trying to do at Techland Africa but then the skill the skill is very scary um and so the way we approach it with Techland Africa is that we we bring in all those resources so we bring the computers we bring in the trained educators and then we incorporate the curriculum as part of it's, it's part and parcel of the schooling. So when the kids kids are learning about digital skills, sending email, building website, as part and part of their curriculum. And some of these schools are so remote, they're off the grid that we're using solar to get to that. But then we're only a small organization. And so we have we have set up for scalability. For example, instead of, of depending on donors to cover the cost for that, we mobilize the parents to contribute. In that, so now if we want to go into a new community, it's a matter of convincing the parents, hey, can you contribute maybe a dollar a month towards this program so we can pay our teachers? But we have the right setup, but then we look at the scale and it's just so scary. Great. It's quite scary indeed. Ramadani, what is your take looking at the Tanzanian landscape on digital literacy? Um, ICT and education. Uh, is yes, go hand in hand. And uh, with this fourth industrial revolution, even in our countries, we are trying to, 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 to really stress on how the technology can use to, 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 to push uh, the, the quality education for all. And this is happening by trying just to implement our educational policy of uh, 2007, uh, whereby we were trying to ensure that teachers are well equipped with the technology literacy and, and knowledge deepening so that they can even help our kids. However, you, you can even imagine our kids are, are, are far uh, trying to uh, getting into uh, the, this industrial revolution or this uh, dynamic uh, uh, change of, of using of technology. So as, as a nation, we also need to, to, to fast track all of the ICT facility or ICT infrastructures to ensure that we will install this facility to support education. You know, ICT is there to, 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 to roll uh, the effectiveness of implementing our, or delivering the education to, 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 to youth. So it's uh, something very important for, as, uh, for, for us as a nation uh, everybody who is interested or who is, who is um, very interesting to ensure that education is for all, uh, we need to, to, to ensure that we, we use this technology uh, to, to help uh, our country. However, in most of our schools now, they have this uh, like um, computer laboratories, uh, laptops, you know, it's becoming very famous. Uh, we know there are some marginalized areas, uh, rural areas, they are still struggling having those facilities. However, in Tanzania now, we are lucky. We have electricity like all over. Very few villages are still yet to be reached with the, with the, the main grid uh, of, of power. So we are, we, we, we are thinking in, in a few years to come, I think most schools and especially government school, even the community schools will have ICT facility due to presence of electricity. Right, it is possible. And Bosun, if I might come back to you, you know, uh, according to the 2021 uh, Ibrahim Forum report, 89% of learners in sub-Saharan Africa do not have access to household computers. 82% of them lack internet access and at least 20 million live in areas not covered by a mobile network. Given this background, you know, what can and cannot work for our learners and educators 
where digital literacy is concerned. Thanks again, Joy. I think, you know, just picking up off the description that I used earlier, which is the wicked uh, problem analogy. I think typically when you're faced with uh, a challenge, which is not only uh, related to trend, but is also related to structure and systems, I think you always have to look inward and be a lot more strategic and intentional about how you fix such a problem. I think typically the challenge we've always had in education is um, education in Africa is controlled by experts, mostly uh, those who don't even live this reality. People probably are not even on the continent. And we've not really truly empowered stakeholders to find solutions to some of the challenges that we face in this space. How much are we engaging with local communities, for instance, and in trying to understand the best models for helping them to solve their problems? How much data set are we taking into consideration when we're building a solution for kids who are based in Kisumu as against Nairobi or as against somewhere in Lagos or Cape Town? There's the assumption that most of the solutions that we can come up with will be one size fit all, which is a big problem in education. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you even start to see the aspiration sometimes also influence the the opportunities for solutions to work. I think because of the challenge that we face and the fact that the world we live in is constantly evolving, it is important that we start to open up how we imagine solutions for education in Africa. I think the first point is we need to find and support many more people like Lenny and uh, uh, Nelly, right? People who are close to the problem, people who have local understanding of the challenges that folks are facing. We need to empower them to be the source of the ideas, source of the solutions. The more of these people we find, the more of them that we back, the more likelihood it is that we're going to find solutions that are contextually relevant and can actually work for our people as well. The second thing is uh, most of the time when we talk about technology, again, we're limited by our understanding and definition of what a digital technology or what technology could be generally. There's been cases all across the continent where radio technology has worked really, really well, for instance, but most people are not leveraging that. When we talk about technology, there's been cases in almost all countries in Africa where every government spend a lot of budget on equipping schools with computers. So they end up putting a computer lab in schools, but these computer labs are oftentimes disconnected from the reality of teaching and, le and learning. You know, some of these things don't have the right content on them. The teachers don't have good understanding of using them. And even some of the learners don't have access to these computer labs in most cases. But we've seen examples. I was in India last week and I was able to visit a lot of communities. And you're seeing how some of these computer labs are being used really smartly as community centers beyond even school hours. And because of that, because there's also strong ownership amongst local community, you can see local community also taking advantage of it as well. So I think the core of it, without mentioning too many specific solutions, is that we need to rethink where ideas for fixing education comes from. Of course, there's a global standard as to what quality education should look like. But education is also strongly linked to agency, both the learners, their parents, what do they feel about what they're learning? Do they understand how education is tied to their future? And what's their understanding as well? Can we mainstream their understanding in the way we prefer the solution? I think if we start to think this way, we can unlock more opportunities for more Nellies uh, to build solutions across Africa. And the more of those that we see, the more realistic solutions we're gonna come, about, uh, come across. Right. Um, and, and speaking to that, Nelly, if I come to you now, you know, you've been able to collaborate with a number of schools in rural Kenya in trying to get young learners to access digital literacy. Um, and, you know, do you get the feeling that our governments are slow in prioritizing digital literacy, not just in Kenya, but around the continent? And uh, what are you doing at TechLit Africa to fill some of these voids? I don't think I don't think our government is slow at implementing it. I think um, I think I have to applaud the government for the CBC curriculum. That is so awesome. I love I love the CBC yeah. curriculum where they have moved away from the 844, which was terrible. I, I went through the 844 system and it was filtering kids out. Like if you don't do well in eighth grade, you don't go to a good high school, you get filtered out. And so we're having people graduating 
from root memorization, not able to do anything. But right now with the CBC, we have kids in sixth grade knowing how to hustle, they know how to sell vegetables in the market, they know how to. So I really applaud the, the, the CBC curriculum and I also applaud like it has its focus in digital literacy. And there's a lot of pushback in the community that like even in the just the, the nation towards the CBC, they're making like, oh, CBC should go away, let's go back to the 844. And you can only improve something by working on it. And so I'm really glad that we've made, we've made the push towards CBC. And I hope that as we keep focusing on it, because you're seeing kids like acting like, um, you know, news presenters, they're doing all these different skills. And so the problem that any government has, and that's what the tech that is able to come in and fill in, is the skill. The government can't go and focus on one community. So as Bosun was talking about, so uh, a, a few years ago, I think in 2016, uh, the previous government distributed tablets in so many schools, I think more than a million tablets. And now when we go to these schools, those tablets are in closets, like nobody has even unpacked them because, right. they, 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 because the, the teachers don't have, like they don't have the training, maybe the content. So most of them are even scared to break it. So they're not being used. So the problem with, with most governments with solutions is that it's very hard to do, pilot. you can only pilot for so much. So with TechLit, we have the luxury of doing one school, 10 schools, 100 schools, 1,000 schools without being accused of favorism. And I think that is that is where the private sector and the governments can work together. Um, so that, that's all, the only thing I've seen with the government in that it's it's a very tricky situation where how do you, how do you slowly grow a solution, right? Without being accused of favorism, right? With TechLit, we can, we can have five years before we cover the whole country and that will seem like impressive milestones and aggressive timeline Nelly, for a government. Nelly, I'm curious to know because your your the work you do focuses on rural Kenya. How are you able to navigate uh, the challenges that are experienced in the rural areas? Uh, challenges such as infrastructure and and all of that. On the contrary, I feel like digital infrastructure is the easiest to build. If you compare to like great roads and <laughs> when you look at the previous revolutions like it's really hard to build roads right it's really hard to fix our banking infrastructure but the digital infrastructure is just a matter of bringing these computers so um so what we do very very simply is that we we take these computers that are going to waste in some of these companies every three years companies are upgrading their it because the computers may be too slow for them mm -hmm. we, we bring them here to our communities and then we uh, we install a custom uh, Linux desktop, which works well in old computers. So instead of a computer going to waste at three years, we're able to extend its lifespan until 12 years. That is another nine years on a computer, right? And then we bring these computers into remote areas and we just need a classroom, right? So we just need a classroom and power. And then our computers are also locally networked. We believe that you don't have to be online to teach those things. On the contrary, for these kids to be online is very dangerous. We don't want our kids to be online at that young age. And so we teach the right. concepts of being online. So the, the computers are networked, they're emailing each other, they're sharing things on their social media, but it's all on a closed network. So they're learning all these things, but completely offline. And so then we just go to a new school over and over again. So I feel like it's, it's a very easy, so what, what we have learned from our predecessors and for, even from the government implementation is that it's not a matter of access, it's a matter of effective use. And effective use comes down to that educator, comes down to that curriculum. Great, I like that. Um, Ramadani, let me come to you because let's imagine a world where we have increased uh, access to digital literacy and also that we have better trained teachers what is the role of digital literacy in leapfrogging uh, 21st century skills? Digital literacy for me is the key um, uh, in, in, in such a way that um, it's coming like a, a resource in education. In education, we have like if we are the, the pedagogy, the way we, 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 we deliver uh, the, the education, we have this content, the, 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 the subjects, you know, but also we have these resources. So technology is coming to act as, as, as a resource to support the pedagogy and the content. So in, 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 in that way, we, it, it is a key 
for, 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 for teachers, for educationists, to ensure that they use well this, uh, how they have equipped well with uh, digital literacy so that to ensure that they, they, they use, you know, sometimes for teachers, they just need basics so that they can help learners uh, throughout using technology, like how being able to, 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 to switch on, on online resources and, and help uh, and, and the model adolescent how they, they switch things online, you know, being able to operate these devices. And sometimes teachers can't even operate devices in a way. Some kids are helping teachers, and especially in, 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 in towns, you know. But in, all, in rural areas where now teachers, you see, they are like more competent than, than, than their, their, their kids. But it's, 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 a, it's a balance which is needed to ensure that teachers are well equipped, but also uh, learners are well supported in the have, have this act. So for me, uh, digital literacy is the key to ensure that it, it supports it, it, it supports as a resources in delivering the education, but also uh, it is a key in the sense that the, our normal life now is, is, is like all over education, uh, all over, all over the, 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 the digitalized, like uh, the money transfers, uh, you know, administrative way, even schools now they communicate using emails, uh, WhatsApps, it's, it's, it's like a formal way of communication. So all of these uh, changes are coming and uh, we need to ensure that we, 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 we fast track uh, the way we integrate technology into education system, the way we integrate technology into how we prepare teachers, the way we integrate technology in how uh, we, we, we do the in-service training, we refresh teachers uh, with the new technology because the, the way this is dynamic and technology is growing very fast in a way that even for teachers, who is now in, 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 in schools for 10, three, three years, they need a refresher. So for example, for us, uh, we, we did with the African Digital School Initiative, try to train in teachers with ICT integration. We were trying to, to move teacher uh, from a low level to high level of digital literacy in a way that it was a incremental uh, way of molding them to be able to uh, integrate te technology. And it was kind of like also, using a model for a whole school development. So we are trying training teachers to ensure that they, 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 they induce uh, the, the whole school activities to integrate technology. So it was coming very well because we were even changing a mindset of teachers. You know, mindset of teachers was changing because at the beginning, technology was seen like uh, an additional thing. But later on, it was used as a tool to support what they are doing. So for, mm -hmm. for me, that was a very good success that teacher we are now using technology as a tool to support their, 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 their daily activities. And you find that now schools were uh, trying to even find other resources to ensure that they, they install at a school to facilitate uh, use of ICT to all the teachers, to most of the students. It is still a challenge. A uh, student has no access. Most of students have no access to these technology devices, but they're using their smartphone now. You know, even the, the study shows a, a bigger number is growing up access to technology. We acknowledge right. that still in rural areas, uh, access is very minimal or limited, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. still most of uh, kids uh, or youth are now accessing technology. I remember uh, we are now currently working with learning assessments, uh, research initiatives. Uh, alive and adapt. All of these are doing a research-based uh, uh, initiatives. So one of the things we have, we have identified is these technology literates are linked with life skills. So students who or, or youth who are our adolescents who are, are very confident with digital literates, they are also able to uh, to, to, to show high proficiencies in the other uh, life, life skills, which is a good sign so that we don't be afraid of getting into technology. We just need to go with a bit of, uh, of, of, of like, yeah, uh, to, be, to, to be conscious that mm -hmm. technology can, one way or another, uh, introduce things that we don't like right. to, our, to our adolescents. Yeah, but we need just to, to ensure that we use that technology in a way that it helps our kids, it helps society. But for me, I see the technology has a lot of benefit eh, from the society point of view right. to the education. I like that idea, but listen to this. We asked some high school teachers and university lecturers if they thought they had the requisite digital skills or digital literacy skills to teach 
uh, using edtech tools and take a look at what they have to say. In Kenya at the moment, I think the, the very basic thing that learners and instructors firstly need is exposure to technology. There are very many students who come to the university and see a computer for the first time and see a smartphone for the first time. So I believe the gap is in exposure to technology where now students and uh, even lecturers, the lecturers who've been teaching their whole lives uh, with paper materials, they do not know how to use projectors, they do not know how to use computers, and then they come to a university like ours and we have to, to train them. So we've taken time as a digital campus to make sure that they are well tooled and they know how to use this, which might look as very basic or very simple equipment to the person out there, but we need them to know how to use a computer, how to use a smartphone, in order now to use it in class, in order to use it for research, in order to use it for learning. So at the very basic level, we require them to have that exposure. Some of the learners here we have in our school, they are coming from the vulnerable families and you realize that in their home they lack electricity and in that manner, they cannot be in a position to possess that a computer so that he or she can be in a position to operate. Some of our teachers here, they lack skills, or they lack knowledge about this, uh, this digital information. So it could be good if we could get uh, some personnel, well-trained personnel to come and train these teachers so that they can be in a position to, uh, to understand more about digital information. The other thing is that we realize that uh, most of the teachers here and sometimes they lack some finance to purchase their, uh, their data so that they can be in a position to process uh, information during those uh, digital educational gadgets. So it could be good if uh, they will install some of the uh, Wi-Fi so that they can be in a position to access uh, information through the computer or laptops or their phones. Exposure is what... Uh he's talking about, but I want to hear your reactions to this. Boso, you know, the fact that you said that most of our education indeed is run by people who don't really have an idea about what it's like to be educated on the continent. Um, in this case, what is the role of edtech innovators in investing in Africa-centric innovations to accelerate education technology solutions? Oh, there's a, there's a significant uh, role for for entrepreneurs and innovators. Uh, and I think if you look at it more broadly, uh, Kenya is always a good example. Uh, people don't talk about this enough, but the fact that you have M-Pesa, which has uh, an incredible penetration rate, is actually an indication of the level of uh, exposure to digital tools. Because for you to be able to use m -Pesa to pay, you already have, you're gonna be exposed to technology in one shape or the other, no matter how basic it is. And when you have economies that are extremely digitally connected, economies that have been moving away from analog into actually using digital solutions in so many ways, you will find that the level of adoption of technology in such societies is high, right? And, and I think um, that's where the role of innovators is extremely strong. You know, you can have the subject matter experts who have a thorough understanding of all the challenges in education. And I say this again, this is something that every country you go in Africa, you have a critical mass of these people, uh, most of them PhDs like myself, who understand all the problems with education. But these people are not the solutions, right? These are, these are the people that should mainstream the understanding of the problem, right? They need to mainstream the understanding of the problem. They need to mainstream issues around learning science. How do you build a solution that takes into consideration how people learn? They need to understand and help to mainstream issues around pedagogy. But the guys who are gonna try different approaches to helping to fix the problem, are the innovators, the guys who understand how to build technology. So they know that they can have a goal at building something that can potentially change education just the way M-Pesa is change payment and banking uh, in Kenya, but also a, a number of East African countries. So I think our role 
is to find ways to inspire these people. Our role is to find ways to invest in them. Our role is to find ways to connect them to the ecosystem. This, this is the important role that we need to play. There's a reason why all over Africa, the education technology space is not booming. It's not as exciting as you'll find in FinTech, for instance, where every young innovator wants to build a FinTech solution. The reason for that is because the foundation and the infrastructure, the backbone for financial services is quite comfortable and used to innovation. But within the education space, you have to understand that education is heavily regulated. Government in the first place will regulate education significantly. In most of our countries, you have probably somewhere around 70 to 80% of the kids in public schools as against private schools, which means they are part of a system that is not gonna be openly ready to adopt technology. And lastly, right. is what we're talking about, the people who actually have the understanding of education in Africa, they're literally gatekeepers. They're very protective of that space. And we need to break them up a little too. We need to loosen them up a little because we need them to support the ed tech entrepreneurs to build. We have to take... Uh, the same approach that we've taken within the startup ecosystem. I've been part of the startup ecosystem in Africa for the last 13 years. What works within the startup ecosystem is experimentation. Empower people to try new ways of doing things. But while we're doing it, because we understand that education is extremely important, we need to ensure that those who understand the real problems come to the table to support these innovators to break, uh, build great ideas. And you know, I know people have been talking about the work that they do. This is why what we're doing with the MasterCard Foundation is extremely important, right? Over the next three years, we're gonna be supporting 72 ed tech startups, both in Nigeria and Kenya, giving them mm -hmm. access to resources, giving them access to expertise so that they have a better understanding of education. But most importantly, Invest, investing significant amount of money in each one of them to actually let them go try. And I believe passionately that if you support 72 companies, you know, it's just a matter of time. You're going to end up with some really, really good guys who are doing fantastic things like Nelly. And we'll see more people winning awards for helping us fix education. And <laughs> Absolutely. And Nelly, speaking of, uh, you know, this award winning work that you're doing, 21st century skills are a great addition to uh, the continent's workforce. And I'm curious to know the kind of uh, ways that you are preparing young learners and these instructors and educators uh, using the ed tech tools that you currently have at TechLit Africa. We actually we work backwards. So we have we have a we have a persona. We have two personas. One is a sophomore, a high a, a second year high school student in Chicago, and one is a sophomore in Mogotio. And we yeah. ask ourselves, if I tell and just them, for purposes, Nelly Mogotio, you need to oh so Mogotio oh, no Mogotio yet okay Mogotio is in rural Kenya. This is where we are headquarters. So okay, so the second year in in Chicago, if I tell them, go get a job as a software engineer at Google, I, I wouldn't say that exactly, but just along those lines, they'll be like, great, right? They will know that, okay, so I want to be a software engineer. Okay, I'm going to go to YouTube. I'm going to look up which stack. I, I want to look up how to be a software engineer. I'm going to learn those skills. I'm going to go to Twitter or even LinkedIn and be a recruiter. And then I'm going to go send an email. I'm going to ask a mentor just by herself. She can do all that just by that single prompt. If I ask a sophomore, like a second year, you know, in Mogotio, if I ask them that, they'll be like, Google, software engineer. And so the question we always ask ourselves is that when our kids graduate high school and they're ready to enter the labor workforce, are they able to use such a prompt and secure a job? And then we walk backwards. What skills do they need? And the most important skills, actually, the single most important skill is just that digital, like that um, being a digital citizen, being up there on video, building a network, making TikToks, talking about what you're working on, right? Talking, like being able to network, being able to realize, oh, I can learn chat GPT and build an application. I can do this. I can network. That, that is it's one of the very soft skills. Those hard skills are very easy to learn. Just go follow a YouTube tutorial. But being able to right. see someone that you admire and make really nice comments and always being commenting on them and then DMing them and asking them for a meeting and then asking them for a job. Those are the skills we are really focusing on. And the way we do it actually is pretty, pretty simple. 
we give our students tutorials. So let's say they are building, let's say they're building a website. So they do a very simple website, like about me, about my school, about that. So they follow a tutorial and then they make their own project. And as they are making their project, we are telling them, you are making this project and you are going to present this project to someone at home, either their parent or their sibling or someone. And so they are thinking about their audience as they're doing that. And then when the project is ready, we hold a camera to them and like, okay, show your mom, show your dad, show your sibling your project. And then they go like, hi dad, look at this website I made. So already they're learning that confidence, they're learning being confident on camera. And that's exactly what happens on the internet. It doesn't matter what skill you have, anything, even if you're really good at selling potatoes, there are 1 million people. So there's always something in the internet, the scale of the internet, no matter what skill you have, you can easily grow that, you can easily make money. And that's what we focus on teaching. So these skills are very, very simple skills for me, maybe because I'm working on it, but I think I find it very, very simple. It's really about the they're mindset. Simple, but <laughs> critical skills. Simple they're subtle. skills. Yeah, they are very, very subtle. Critical. Yeah, yeah, to the 21st century uh, kind of workforce. And so before we come to Ramadani, I want us to quickly go into uh, some of the views that these teachers and lecturers heard in the kind of support that they need uh, to increase the uptake of digital literacy. Watch. So first of all, we need to have electricity across the entire country. So we need to have that last mile connectivity for all our citizens. Once that is done, then now we can be able to provide internet access, you know, and we have, like today we are talking about 5G in Kenya, but how many other parts, like in Nairobi, we have 5G already being uh, implemented. But now what about other parts of the country? You know, we are st many of them still have very poor access to internet. And again, as I said, if we need to have e-learning successful, it has to have uh, this digital, I mean, the, to have this 5G or broadband access for our students or for our learners. I'd like to ask that our nation and our county invests in educational institutions and especially in educational technology. Today, the world's technology is changing very quickly. What you might think that uh, happened last year could be very relevant tomorrow. So technology is quickly changing and we are asking that our governments, both at the national and the local level, keep pace with this so that students who not only come to the university but start at the grassroots at basic education level, in a grade level, high school, all the way to university level, have exposure and are able to use this technology when they come to the university. There we go. And Ramadani, I'm thinking that we can tie this conversation to policies. Do we have policies around edtech that support the introduction and implementation of digital literacy programs in our education ecosystem? Because I believe that this here is the, the one missing link that could turn things around for us. There are policies about the ICT, uh, and they are very well structured. If you follow them, they, 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 they are very promising eh, for, for quality education. But I think the issue is how we implement them. I know there are some those are challenges as we discussed, but, but still also I think uh, we, we need to emphasize more. We need more effort on education. People are not investing much in, 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 in education. They are, they, are, they, are, they are investing in a way that um, they are not looking at a point which one is, is it, 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 it helps to reach out to many um, uh, adolescents at a time. You know, for example, um, in, 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 you, can, you may have maybe five to 10 schools around and then you can equip uh, facilities in those schools. And if you have, you have fewer, fewer teachers, one teacher can teach 10 to, 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 to left school using technology. So for me, I believe if we prioritize yeah, you using technology as the, our policies is set, we implement it effectively. And I think we can, we can, we can, we can move uh, the ed tech to a next level. Great. Nelly, uh, what kind of government support, if any, uh, would you need to advance the work that you're doing? Actually, uh, before I answer that question, I do have a, a counterpoint to what we we're just talking about here. I think, right. I think, uh, talk, talking about like for me when when I hear like all the steps that we we'll need to do before we can implement like digital literacy in a school, it's kind of scary that hey, 
hey, we need to get all our schools electrified. Okay, then we need to get it all on the internet. And then we need to have extra classrooms. I think, I think, I think as Africans, as the continent, we are very, very resourceful. We are super resourceful. So how can we, what, what is the MVP we can have? What is the MVP we can have instead of, in, that will not require us to inject massive amount of capital that we don't have? And that's the question, I don't have an answer to that, but that's the question. So when, when, as I'm building a product, as I'm building a service, I always think about the MVP. Can you imagine if, right. if I was doing Tech Led Africa and I kept thinking, okay, I need to build 10 schools and then I need to have the kids in the schools and then I need to have this perfect situation before I implement this. So uh, I like the example you mentioned about Ramadani, about like how to send text messages. In a, so I, of course, I, like, I, I, I kind of I got really scared about all the steps we need to do and it's very expensive and we don't have those resources. So the question is, right. like, what, is the MVP, what is the simplest thing we can get to that will actually get those answers without needing to invest so much infrastructure? So for me, right. I think, uh, so I think for us, uh, our, biggest, our biggest challenge is always the mindset that the people have. And so for us, we have, what, what, we, what we do that, that ensures that we can easily scale and sustain our, our product is getting the schools and the parents to contribute, to contribute for the programs, right? So we hire local educators that we train and they go into schools and deliver the service and they're constantly trained and we have the constant curriculum so that a school in Mombasa can have the same curriculum as a school all the way in Northern Kenya. The biggest challenge is that the schools are not, the, the idea of contributing even a dollar per month, they're just saying like, get the government to do it, get the donors to do it. So for us, most of our work is not really on the government side, it's really about in our communities. I have this concept to GTG me right how can you how can we support this project in, instead of waiting for the government to come and do it instead of waiting for yeah so so that is like our challenge is the opposite in that we're trying to mobilize the communities and telling them hey look the computers are here if we just contribute a dollar a month it means that this program can run forever you know going forward can we level the digital literacy playing field given the fragmented learning populations with varying learning outcomes and milestones across the continent nelly let me start with you that's a really hard question <laughs> i don't know i i think for me I, I really think that for what we've seen with our kids in that you one month into the program they have most of the skills that we're trying to do it and we're just working on building it up so i think right. i think the question is always like the level playing field, what is that? Like, it's really hard, right? For, for a kid who has grown up with computer all their life, it's not gonna be the same with a kid who's only getting a lessons, like only in school. And so the question mm -hmm. should not be, um, I think leveling the playing field, the question should always be, what is the best that we can do? And how can we build on top of that? We, can't, we cannot mm -hmm. sit and do nothing. We just have to start moving towards the goal and see how far we can get. Great. Ramadani, in about a minute, what do you think we need to do going forward? You may plan together as Africa, as the world, as, as, as Tanzania, but still you may find some imbalances because of um, everyone at its, its, its position sometimes has its own uh, priority. I think like, I think when I go this way, uh, for me, uh, it's more important than uh, going the way we agreed. So, that also affects uh, the, this uh, ed tech movement, you know. So I think it's important as, as, as a nation for, for, for us to, to agree that we may go in a different path. We may prioritize different uh, this uh, ed tech, but still we, might, we, we need to ensure that it contributes to quality education. Great. And Bosung, I'm giving you the last word uh, on this one. Going forward, do you think we can level the playing field or do we need to use a different uh, solution method for this one? As, as a proponent um, you know, of innovation, Nelly, unfortunately, my answer will be yes, we can level the playing field. We know that realistically, we know that realistically is tough. Uh, but when you're wearing innovation hats, your thinking is always that everything is possible. And we need to be aggressive. I think we need to be aggressive with education. Uh, one way to do it is let's ensure that we can demonstrate return on investment on every dollar that we put into education. This is something that we're still struggling to do. When government put computers in school, 
how does that compete to how does how do they lead to improved learning outcomes for the kids who are there because the money that is being spent on this project is significant and until we start to see it as a formal business if you invest in 1000 computers and you cannot see the result it's going to be a lot harder for you to invest in 1 million computers so i think what we need to, be, to do is be aggressive about how we measure the impact of the work that is going on in education how do we mainstream the evidence as well the things that nelly will be learning from a lot of the projects that she's conducting and uh, with the community that she's working with are we documenting what she's learning and are we using that evidence to inform other people who might want to do the same kind of work. I think Africa needs to be very aggressive about, you know, documenting our learnings, uh, ensuring that we're mainstreaming the evidence and the evidence is inspiring the actions that we take moving forward. Love that. And thank you all so much for making time for this conversation. Nelly Cheboy, founder and CEO, TechLit Africa, who also, by the way, left a job uh, abroad to come back home and impact uh, young learners in rural Kenya. And we also have Ramadani Matimbwa, ADAPT Project Coordinator at JESSE, and Dr. Bosun Tijani, co-founder and CEO at CC Herb Nigeria. Thank you all so much for such a forward-thinking conversation. And of course, infrastructure or the lack thereof uh, continues to be a setback in implementation of digital literacy and indeed edtech solutions in learning institutions, but our subsequent editions of EdTech Monday Africa will seek to find solutions to this challenge. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. Until the next one, thank you all for watching. Bye bye for now. EdTech Mondays Africa is supported by the MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning in ICT and is part of the Foundation's Young Africa Works programming.